Butch Hartman, the man, the myth, the self-proclaimed creator of your childhood. We know him as the creator of the Fairly Odd Parents, Danny Phantom, Tough Puppy, and Bunsen is a Beast. Two of these cartoons were very successful and were pillars of Nickelodeon, second only to The Sponge. Butch etched out a legacy through his artistic pursuits, business savviness, and quite frankly, his charm. But unfortunately for Butch, his hubris would be his downfall, as his true colors would emerge, giving the world a much more colorful picture of his ego and pettiness. This once beloved creator went from being a cool uncle who talked about his creations and passions on YouTube, to being universally perceived as untrustworthy and a pompous charlatan. If you guys think you're gonna knock me down or make me fail, do you know, do you, do you know who you're dealing with? Do you really know? Do you have any idea who you're dealing with? Do you know who you're dealing with? What exactly happened that brought down Butch's career? What really began his descent into madness? After all of his successes, mild successes, and non-successes, the following story is a cautionary tale about the pitfalls of pride and how it can bring a person down. So let us find out what ruined Butch Hartman. But before we do, a quick word from our sponsor, Helix Sleep. I truly cannot sing Helix Sleep's praises enough. So I'm always thrilled to partner up with them to spread the good word. Yes, the good word. The good word about beds. They have delivered unparalleled comfort and support tailored precisely to my unique needs. And they can do the same for you, and I mean that. This is the best bed I've ever had. Like, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, this is a sponsored bed? It's incredible. This is the best thing ever. Some might even say that I am quite the Helix Evangelist. But can you blame me? I'm just speaking the gospel here, folks. And the gospel speaks truth. Hallelujah. Now, if you're not already familiar, the team at Helix Sleep are premium mattress makers, creating top quality mattresses and bedding customized for each individual's unique needs. Unlike most mattress shops, Helix delivers your mattress directly to your home with free shipping to the continental USA. Now, I'm sure you've experienced how challenging it can be to haul a full size or even a king size mattress up the stairs. Well, Helix has found a way to roll up their mattresses into a compact box for incredibly convenient delivery and setup. Uh, you know how much I value a good night's sleep. I mean, everyone should. Who, who doesn't like to sleep well? Who's the freak who's like, I don't want to sleep? You're a vampire. A pox upon thee. I've been enjoying Helix mattresses for quite some time now. Like, it's been like three or four years. I will always be the first in line to say that Helix mattresses have revolutionized my sleep. As a side sleeper who prefers a medium firm mattress, my Helix King Midnight Lux has been a perfect fit. Like I was at a hotel about a month ago and I was on their bed and I was like, this is terrible. I miss my mattress. I want to go home. I want to sleep on my Helix because it's that good. Like not even joking. It is excellent. Now, Helix understands that shopping for a new mattress is not the easiest process. Fortunately, they've crafted up a sleep quiz that you can take to help match you with your next mattress. Tell them the truth. Do you sleep on your back? Are you a side sleeper like me? And maybe you prefer to face down on your stomach. Indulge the Helix sleep quiz to your sleepy habits, and it will pair you up with your next sleeping canvas. Yes, you're the paint, and the mattress is the canvas splat. The sleep quiz exists to oblige. And if you share your bed with a partner, uh, oh, lucky you, right? Rest assured, there's a perfect compromise for the both of you. Even if it's your dog or cat, tell them, take the quiz with them. With a wide range of mattresses and Helix Arsenal, you can bet that there's something for you or your loved ones. With 20 unique mattresses to choose from, you can find yourself on an award-winning Lux or Ultra Premium Elite. Or if you're a bigger or taller person, like me, a Helix Plus mattress will be your fit. And for the little ones in our lives, there's the Helix Kids mattress, designed for growing bodies and endorsed by child sleep and medical experts. Yeah, imagine your kids actually looking forward to going to sleep, huh? Well, that's a revolutionary. So if you're feeling apprehensive about buying something you have not had a chance to try, Helix totally gets it. After all, you're making a substantial investment in something you'd be spending a third of your life on. Well, Helix offers a 100-day sleep trial. 
so you can make sure that you love your mattress. Like, you don't need any doubts. You can, you can trust the process. They are legit. And with a 10-year warranty, plus flexible financing options, a premium sleep experience is never out of reach. So if you're ready to experience genuine comfort and support like never before, I highly recommend checking out Helix Sleep. Click the link down below or go to helixsleep.com slash saberspark to get 20% off your Helix mattress plus two pillows for free. Once you've experienced Helix's elevated sleeping experience, you'll be spreading the gospel as much as I do. Thanks to Helix for teaming up with us to spread the good word on better sleep. And on that note, back to the video. Elmer Earl Hartman IV, a.k.a. Butch Hartman, was the oldest of four children and grew up as a self-described attention freak. He loved drawing and pursued his artistic talents as a young adult for fun and profit. The earliest you can find of him in the Hollywood scene is when he appeared as a contestant in Hollywood Squares and Body Language in 1985. Butch took on small bit parts and gigs around LA to fund his college education at Cal Arts, later graduating with a BFA in 1987. From there, Butch began his animation career, job hopping between different gigs and proudly completing them in no time flat. Butch had rock solid charisma, confidence, and was going to prove himself. He began work as an in betweener on Dom Bluth's An American Tale and then a character designer and storyboard artist for the 1980s My Little Pony. In the early 1990s, Hartman started to hit his stride. He worked as a character designer and storyboard artist for Marvel, and later applied these skills at Ruby Spears Productions. Once they merged with Hanna-Barbera, Butch moved on to Cartoon Network as a writer, director, and storyboard artist on such shows as Dexter's Lab, Johnny Bravo, and I Am Weasel. Butch would describe his time there as, quote, a worker who always tried to adapt to any position on the job, end quote. If the crew needed backgrounds, he drew backgrounds. If they needed storyboards, he drew storyboards. Even saying, quote, they would give me a sentence like, Dexter and Dee Dee go into an anthill, and Dexter has an invention called the ant pants, and I would just create a story around that while they were boarding it. At the end of the day, the episode came out saying storyboard by Butch Hartman, but written by the guy who gave me the sentence. <laughs> Not very fair. End quote. Butch aimed to be any company's go-to guy for anything, to show how valuable he was to a project. And he kept that up, networking with heads like Fred Seibert and working alongside future notable creators like Seth MacFarlane of Family Guy. The two would later collaborate for Oh Yeah Cartoons, making a short called Zoommates. Butch and Seth remained good friends, with Seth even naming a Family Guy character after him, Dr. Elmer Hartman, a medical buffoon known for his high level of incompetence. A potential foreshadowing? Who can say? I don't know, I didn't read the whole Wikipedia entry, but the good news is that what he has is highly treatable, with radiation first and, if necessary, chemotherapy. <coughs> Butch would swap between going as Elmer and Butch Hartman in show credits, usually depending on the gig he was working on, but he fully committed to using his nickname Butch once he got his big break. In October of 1997, Butch was working on Johnny Bravo when the first season concluded, and it was unclear whether they would be renewed for a second season, so the entire staff was let go, including him. Hartman decided to save himself from unemployment by making a show of his own. After his contract with Hanna-Barbera expired, Butch was contacted by his former employer, Fred Seibert, at his newfound company, Frederator Studios. Fred saw Butch's value as a creator and wanted to bring him onto Oh Yeah Cartoons, his animated pilot series for Nickelodeon. As Fred was very impressed by Butch's work, and wanted to see Hartman create his own show. He leaped at the chance. In December of 1997, he created a pitch for a show he called The Fairly God Parents, which eventually became the Nicktoon staple to this day, Fairly Odd Parents. The idea for The Fairly Odd Parents grew out of Hartman's desire to find a way to move his main character from place to place 
without being beholden to the traditional story scene transition. He thought about using science, but Dexter's laboratory already existed. So with that option out of the picture, Hartman went with magic and drew up a small bucktooth boy and named him Timmy Turner, after his younger brother, Tim Hartman. And instead of giving the magic to Timmy, he decided to give him a magical friend. Quote, Maybe I'll do a Cinderella thing with a fairy godmother. So I drew Wanda, who at that time was named Venus. I drew this character and I thought, well, I've never seen a fairy godfather before. So I drew a fairy godfather, which was Cosmo. The rest is kind of history. End quote. And all that together became the Fairly Odd Parents. With 10 fully animated Fairly Odd Parents short cartoons on Oh Yeah, they aired on Nickelodeon and then focus tested, refining the look and feel as it was developed into a series. The full process took about two to three years before the Fairly Odd Parents first premiered on March 30th, 2001. There were a ton of expectations on this series. Fred Seibert and Nickelodeon both loved the pilot concept, and Butch was confident that it would be a hit. And he said, you know, I think we're going to get a series out of this. I'm sure we're going to get a series. And when we get one, it's going to be the number one series in all of cartoons. And sure enough, he was right. Uh, not quite, but it will be close. The main challenge with discussing Butch nowadays is that his fall has become as prolific as his success in the animation space. It's hard to separate from his current image of being a sensitive egomaniac with a bluntly religious cartoon and a non-existent streaming service funded through alleged misinformation. So, let's put that all to the side for now, because we can't really understand the fall of Butch Hartman without looking into his rise first. And yes, Butch Hartman did have successful shows. Two, uh, arguably three. He also has been involved with other series, channels, and projects that put him on the map as a wholesome, creative, and a fun, uncle-like cartoon creator. So, what could possibly go wrong? A lot can, and it starts with the pinnacle of his career, The Fairly Odd Parents. Once more, the story is about 10-year-old Timmy Turner and his fairy godparents, Cosmo and Wanda as they save him from his neglectful parents and violently abusive babysitter. They grant their godchild any wish he wants, and we follow how those wishes, more often than not, blow up in his face, resulting in him learning valuable life lessons and getting into kooky shenanigans. This is the series that put Butch Hartman on the map with Nickelodeon. The Fairly Odd Parents became an iconic brand for the network, spanning 10 seasons with 172 episodes, along with 10 TV movies, with some like Channel Chasers being considered cult classics of animated TV movies, and a definitive ending to the series for others. Sporting merch, video games, and countless fans, that success was recognized through numerous awards and nominations. Fairly Odd Parents did get nominated for the Kids' Choice Award seven times as well, but always lost to Steven Hillenburg's SpongeBob SquarePants, which uh, <laughs> definitely did not rub Butch the wrong way. And season two just really started to take off like a rocket, and Fairly Odd Parents was being considered to be a very, very huge hit. There were even times we kind of surpassed SpongeBob in the ratings, maybe once or twice. But despite not being the golden child of Nickelodeon, Fairly Odd Parents grew as a brand, even leading to Nickelodeon approaching Hartman with the idea of adapting the show into live action movies. Now, there were some false starts. But eventually, the first TV movie came out in 2011, starring Drake Bell, signaling Nick's confidence in the show's potential beyond animation. And it did garner quite a huge success, with 5.8 million viewership at release. However, with A Fairly Odd Christmas in 2012 and Fairly Odd Summer in 2014, viewership numbers kept steadily declining. But declining numbers is standard for many long-running shows, and with Nickelodeon always pushing SpongeBob as the network's mascot, essentially their version of Mickey Mouse, 
It was impressive that Fairly Odd Parents could keep its spot as Nickelodeon's arguably second favorite cartoon. And with such a number two success, Nickelodeon came to Butch asking if he had any other ideas. Butch, being the idea guy, pitched a show about a boy with ghost powers battling ghosts from the ghost zone, all while hiding his identity from his bumbling ghost hunting parents and attending the biggest challenge of any young person's life, high school. Nickelodeon loved the concept, and within two years, Butch developed the idea into his next show, Danny Phantom. Premiering on April 3rd, 2004, Danny Phantom shook up Butch's Fairly Odd Parents formula. While the former was your standard silly episodic comedy with a moral of the week tying everything together, Danny Phantom was Butch's step into producing an action superhero show with serialized elements. But it still had the wacky episodic silliness that became a trademark of Hartman's work. I am the Box Ghost! Who are you? Oh, seriously, who is she? The show found its balance of action set pieces and serialized story, giving Danny new superpowers that developed over the story and a rogues gallery of recurring villains. Also a blossoming romance with his goth girl best friend, Sam and arguably fumbling of the entire third season, but we'll save that topic for another video. Danny Phantom became the cult classic on Butch's cartoon resume, going for three seasons over the span of 53 episodes. A solid run overall, and nothing short of the creator spouting some sort of nonsense could possibly taint the legacy of Danny Phantom. Well, not yet at least. The series still garnered great success for Butch, keeping Hartman in a role with Nickelodeon's successes and good graces. So, of course, Nickelodeon would come to Butch again for another hit show from his cartoon-churning cranium. And he pitched Get Smart with a Dog. <gasps> Boom. Tough puppy. Premiering on October 2nd, 2010. With Jerry Trainer of iCarly fame playing the canine lead Dudley Puppy, the show is a send-up of spies and secret agents. Dudley is a labradoodle recruited into a task force called Tough, the turbo undercover fighting force to fight injustice throughout the city of Petropolis, in which he lives alongside his cat partner, Kitty Catswell. Now, unlike Danny Phantom, which juggled comedy and dramatic storytelling, Tough Puppy was more strictly a comedy about a dumb dog saving the day and fighting increasingly weird and nonsensical villains. It kept consistent success alongside Danny Phantom, with both series running for three seasons, with Tough Puppy running slightly longer, capping off at 60 episodes. By numbers, their success should be very comparable. But in the grand scope, Danny Phantom is more remembered as a cult classic while Tough, which is admittedly goofy fun, did not leave the same cultural impact as Danny Phantom or Fairly Odd Parents. Now, there were some people picketing for more Danny Phantom even to this very day. When Nickelodeon put Dudley down, though, no one was making a fuss. No one really cared. There is not as many interviews with Butch about the success of Tough Puppy, with a majority of the interviews about Tough Puppy being before its launch and more detailing Butch's success on his other two shows. So the third jewel on his cartoon making crown was uh, a bit lackluster, but it was not awful either. And Tuff filled a time slot in Nickelodeon's lineup. Butch was still riding high and decided his next step forward was as his own independent creator on YouTube. After starting his own channel in 2015, this is where Butch changed from the faceless creator behind his cartoons and to the fun uncle of animation. Butch's channel was where he would hold Q&As, unboxings, and challenge videos. It's a channel that clearly wants a vibrant, fun atmosphere for its fans. Celebrating fan theories, goofing around with character designs, tracing others' artwork, and finishing off with some in-depth Q&As to get into the interesting truths behind Hollywood that only he could give answers to. So it's no wonder he began growing an audience rapidly. 
passing 100,000 subscribers in 2017. So much so that Butch started a secondary channel and podcast called Speech Bubble. This is where Butch would interview fellow creatives, speak more about his shows, children's media, and a lot more, bringing on people like Tara Strong and Rob Paulson to name a few. Both channels were his way of solidifying himself into a personality brand like other Hollywood celebrities with his brand being the fun creator of your childhood. And initially, it worked exceptionally well. Watching the videos on the surface gives off this vibe of a well-meaning, if somewhat boomer humor guy, wanting to connect personally with the audience because he knows that you love his cartoons. Hey, Hart fans. My name is Butch Hartman. It kind of sounds like the same thing. We'll double back on his YouTube channel later on in the video because the next thing in line for Butch was his next cartoon, Bunsen is a Beast. Premiering on January 16th, 2017, the show came about from a sketch Hartman was working on about a little boy facing a little monster. The head of Nick at the time, Russell Hicks, happened to walk by and saw Butch's sketch and said, quote, that looks great, what's that? And Butch said, it's Bunsen is a Beast. It's about the first beast to ever go to human school. And Hicks said, well, let's get working on that. Boom, you got a new show. Ego struggling aside, the show was refined to center around a blue fluffy monster named Bunsen, the first beast to attend Muckle Dunk Middle School. And with his human friend, Mikey Monroe, they navigate through school as Bunsen feels the pressure to prove that monsters can coexist peacefully without eating and harming others. Now, if that sounds like a reverse of My Gym Partner's a Monkey, even down to a small redhead boy, then you are mistaken, because Mikey Monroe is named after Butch's brother, Mike Hartman. So if you wanted My Gym Partner's a Monkey, <laughs> don't worry, we got buns and it's a beast at home. Honestly, out of the Hartman shows, Bunsen was the least successful, as it felt like it disappeared as quickly as it aired. And that's despite apparently receiving positive ratings, with LA Times praising the show, likening it to an early Hanna-Barbera cartoon with the engine of Tex Avery at his eye-popping extreme, and commending its message about embracing outsiders as particularly timely. My opinion? <laughs> it's, uh, it's loud. But positive reviews aside, the ratings weren't good enough to warrant a second season, so Bunsen as a Beast was cancelled after airing only one season of 26 episodes. It had become Hartman's largest flop, and the first major stain on his resume, with many more to follow. Uh, despite this setback, Butch was still working on season 10 of Fairly Odd Parents at the same time. However, his Cash Cow series would not last as it too was also due for cancellation. To deal with this massive loss, Butch went onto YouTube to announce his resignation from Nickelodeon in 2018. Now, it is true that there is a bit of a dip in his success, but in the end, these four shows and his YouTube channel quantify the best version of Butch that we knew as his audience and fans as a kind of goofy, cringy creative who felt grounded and approachable to talk to. And it's through these many successes that Butch would also go out there and teach his mottos and ways of circumventing the Hollywood landscape so you could sell your own shows just like him. You could even read all about it in his book, Mad Hustle, which details the ins and outs of pitching and selling a show in Hollywood even sporting the tagline, how bad do you want to win? I'll save you some time from reading it or watching an upsetting amount of repetitive interviews by breaking down his advice and mottos here. Number one, have no fear. So many people are afraid of things and sometimes the only thing that's keeping you away from your goal is your own fear. No matter how scary or far away your goal seems, you'll never get there if you don't keep moving forward. Number two, you have to believe in yourself and your work. 
Butch is quoted saying, Every show that I've gotten on television has started with just one drawing before anyone else believed in it. End quote. Number three, don't ever stop and don't ever give up. If you stop, it's completely your fault. Well, I think that's self-explanatory, as he puts it. He is living proof you can do it. And if you cannot, it's your fault. That's a passive-aggressive way of putting it. And number four, keep moving forward and be nice to people. Never be a prima donna because the person you're rude to today might be your boss tomorrow. Now, with that last bit of advice especially, it really just sets up perfectly a true prima donna plummet. A fall from grace, if you will. From the creator of your childhood to a man who is unapologetically egocentric and refuses to take accountability for his actions. Now, you might be wondering, when did the rose-tinted glasses lift from the audience's eyes? In short, the beginning of the end was with his snake oil streaming service, Oaxis. Now, we could cut the video short and just end it there, but I don't think it's fair to boil it down to just that. The Oaxis controversy for Butch may have started getting people to notice the smoke, but there has been a growing fire surrounding Butch Hartman that was building up over the decades. Even if Butch put up the guise of being the fun, friendly uncle, his petty and egotistical nature permeates throughout his story, going even all the way back to his work on My Little Pony, where he is quoted saying, I started out being a cartoonist at school, but I went to CalArts to study. I was working on My Little Pony in the 80s, but I got fired because I couldn't draw the ponies well enough. It was a horrible show. End quote. I'm talking about the terrible My Little Pony from the mid-1980s. I worked on that show, and it was one of the hardest experiences of my life because, number one, it was something I hadn't designed myself. Back in the 1980s were cheap toy commercials to be fair to Butch. But was MLP really that bad? Or did it just really upset Butch that he had no control over the project and his art style just did not work with what they wanted? It doesn't look good. I, it, it's not, the stories aren't great. I'm not disparaging anyone who worked on it, but it just, all the pieces together didn't come together very well. It's not a really good, not a very well-remembered series. To make it clear, the injustice to Butch was him being fired for not being able to do the job. Most animators working on a show have to work with the model sheets of the characters to learn how to draw them consistently. So if that's what he was fired for, I'd straight up call that a skill issue. Now, I can't speak to the quality of the show's direction for the storyboard artist or character designers at the time. But for Butch to get so hung up on a setback like that shows an immaturity at acknowledging his limitations. He can acknowledge it happened, but it wasn't that the quality of his work was bad. It was that the show was bad. There's also an odd perpetual line he says whenever he brings up the possibility of working with Disney. Hartman has said throughout his YouTube channel that he has never worked for Disney. So my dream was to work for Disney back in the day. And to this day, I've never worked for Disney. It's really weird. All these years I've been in animation, I never actually went to Disney and worked there. I've visited there many times, known a ton of people there, but I never really have worked there. Liar! Liar! Get back, witch! Here's the thing, though. He did. Hartman is listed on his IMDb as Elmer Hartman on the Timon and Pumbaa and Mickey Mouse Works TV shows, both for a singular episode as a storyboard artist and as a character designer for one episode of 101 Dalmatians, the series. Also, he did pick up work for Tailspin, which he himself admits on video. One of the very first Disney jobs I ever got was on a show called Tailspin, and uh, I got hired to do some storyboard help on that show. And I didn't really get to keep the job that long because they were drawing Super Disney, and I was drawing Super Hanna-Barbera, and my style just did not fit into that style. Apparently, he was even a body reference for John Smith and Disney's Pocahontas. Now, what I'm saying here is just speculation, obviously. But given Butch's short time at Disney, could the reason he says he never worked for Disney be because he just did not measure up to the standards those shows wanted? Now, I can't say either way, because Butch is saying he never worked for them when we have literal clear evidence that credits him. The impression I get is that Butch saw the shows he worked on as lesser quality than working for Walt Disney Animation Studios, the most prestigious name in American feature animation, or at least at the time. 
So I think he was hurt that he could not make it up to the feature film level and minimize his experience there, that he never really worked at Disney, which also can be said for when Butch Hartman worked on Dougal in 2006. <sighs> yeah, remember Dougal? It originally was called The Magical Roundabout in the UK. Then it was modernized for the American audience, which was Butch's job to do. Butch's initial idea to rework the magical roundabout was to add in a live-action frame story that involved an old man reading a story to his grandchild, which, yeah, he, uh, <laughs> blatantly borrowed the framing device from the Princess Bride. What is it? What's the matter? They're kissing again. Do we have to hear the kissing part? Someday you may not mind so much. Butch was having to rewrite the whole film script, line per line, with some changes to the dialogue to make it more appealing to American audiences. His original script was also meant to stay in sync with the animation, unlike the final version, which, uh... Two words, sir. Personal hygiene. <laughs> Does not. When the film was released, Hartman's original material was rewritten and re-recorded without his consent by Harvey Weinstein, with only about 3% of his material ever made it into the final version by Butch's estimate, and makes it very clear in a tweet and also on video. While it's definitely more justified why he'd be so angry over his work being overwritten with Dougal, this constant anger speaks to the type of creative he is. One that puts so much of his own ego within his work that whenever his art or writing is not fully respected or appreciated, he digs in his heels and despises those who are against him. It doesn't matter how constructive or legitimate the criticism is or that it could make the final production that much better. You cannot critique somebody like this. Butch takes every piece of criticism personally and gets on the defensive. He's not willing to admit his own faults, weaknesses, or feel that his work effort has been diminished. But that would continue to happen. With Fairly Odd Parents and Danny Phantom in particular, Butch would take actions that both confused fans and dragged out his shows become homogenized messes by their cancellations. As successful as Fairly Odd Parents was on Nickelodeon, it can never break through to being anywhere near as popular as the number one show on the network. You guessed it, SpongeBob SquarePants. Fairly Odd Parents, by Butch's omission, was even canceled and brought back five times over its series run. Even cartoonishly canceled and brought back within a 24 hour period by the Nickelodeon executives. Fairly Odd Parents was actually canceled about five times during that period. The show was doing fantastic, but for some reason, uh, Nickelodeon just decided not to keep doing the show. Ratings had never gone down on the show, but once again, for some reason, uh, Nickelodeon, I guess they had just been done with Fairly Odd Parents a long time ago. Yeah, we're done. Thanks very much. Well, it's been nice knowing me. Now, Fairly Odd Parents ratings are hard to confirm, but based on viewership that is listed in our sources, viewership was listed consistently until season five and six, where a majority of specials hit high viewership numbers, but regular episodes were static. There was a clear decline in interest as time went on as episode plots became more stale and concepts started becoming samey and what Timmy and the fairies could do was becoming tapped out. Interviewers were asking Butch about the difficulty of coming up with new, fresh ideas. But Butch would confidently answer that it may be difficult, but their team does their best to make everything fresh and new. While it holds true that for a long-standing series, revitalizing them with new concept or characters can help grant new life. Despite the many ideas Butch put into revitalizing Fairly Odd Parents, the key issue with all of them is that they really changed nothing. They were more like a bandage rather than a cure, since the show would inevitably go back to the same status quo. Poof was Cosmo and Wanda's fairy godbaby who was brought on as, in Butch's description, a consolation prize from Nick for considering to cancel Fairly Odd Parents. So Butch was given a blank check to put whatever he wanted into the show to liven up the series again. So he decided on getting Cosmo, um, impreg with Wanda and having a baby boy poof. 
That is certainly an unusual idea, but I guess Nickelodeon loved it. The concept was initially written in 2002 by Butch for a Fairly Odd Parents feature film that was never produced. But once Poof's episode Fairly Odd Baby was released as the first episode of season 6, it became the biggest success the show had seen in ratings in its entire run up until that point. And Butch was so excited with Poof as a character that he even went as far as to make an anti-fairy named Foop as Poof's foil, and have dreams of creating a Poof Foop spin-off show. According to Butch, Nickelodeon called him soon after and praised him for his work granting him another season for Fairly Odd Parents with Poof's successful special. However, the writing team had no idea what to do with Poof after they did all the it's a fairy but a baby and it's an anti-fairy but a baby. The series became less about Timmy overcoming issues born from his wishes and just dealing with magic mishaps from Poof because now that Poof exists, we need to justify his inclusion. It's why after a while, Poof and Foop began becoming more and more infrequent in the show, until in season 10 in the episode Certifiable Super Sitter, they had their last appearance three episodes before the series finale. So, if some babies could not add enough flavor to the show, what about a dog? You know, one that talks, and it's magical too. It's like the baby, but with extra steps. Yeah, remember Sparky? Timmy's fairy god dog? Hmm. I think he needs a little more attitude. Oh yeah, there you go. There it is, right there. Well, as Butch describes him, quote, Sparky is a magical talking fairy dog with magic dog powers. He can make fire hydrants appear out of thin air and poof up cats to chase. He's also a character with a past and done everything. For example, when Timmy has to go to Mexico, Sparky says he knows a guy who can set them up with passports." End quote. From his introduction, Sparky was an incredibly redundant character, because you could literally do the exact same gags with already present characters. But it doesn't really matter, as Sparky was introduced in season 9's premiere and was gone after the same season's finale which ironically has him barely in the story. It instead focuses heavily more on Foop and anti-Sparky. Now that we're working together, there are a couple of ground rules you need to follow, Poop. It's Foop. Never correct me! And the finale just is, uh, what if Sparky had an anti-fairy? Yeah, just like they did with Poof and Foop. When your show gets so firmly into seasonal rot that you invent Scrappy-Doo all over again, you know you messed up. Season 10 showed the last desperate attempt at relevance by creating Chloe Carmichael, the new godchild of Cosmo and Wanda. Chloe, in particular, was a studio mandate, asked by a Nickelodeon executive, so Fairly Odd Parents could grow a more female demographic. So, Butch developed Chloe as a new neighbor character that would share Cosmo and Wanda with Timmy, so she can make wishes as well. Based on Hartman's niece of the same name, Chloe was added to the show and acted as the pure, sweet, generous god kid to counter Timmy, who was a self-serving brat. Chloe would make wishes for the benefit of others without understanding the disasters her wishes can cause. It's a funny enough concept to shift the show's established formula. Giving Cosmo and Wanda to different kinds of kids can really shape things up to keep the core concept fresh. But rather than revitalize the show, Chloe's mixed reception actually highlighted how her dynamic destroyed every established rule in the show's universe. It speaks volumes that this was the season where this meme came from. Every rule was broken without any regard, because there was no real standard of quality anymore in the writing. And it's just an insult to injury that the episode is just tedious to watch with a stuff just happens a lot plot. By season 10, Fairly Odd Parents became a parody of itself. They wrote themselves into a corner by removing previous characters, adding new ones, and making a flagrant disregard for the show's rules. Tammy becomes a fully static character and never learns anything from his experiences. Some episodes he acts like such a disgusting little monster instead of a well-meaning if somewhat selfish child. Even the writing gives all the way up, with Crocker helping people and having the means to get to magical land. Oh my god, somebody take this show out behind the woodshed and put it out of its misery. Yeah, right next to Sparky. Then in February of 2018, 
Nickelodeon pulled the plug and officially canceled The Fairly Odd Parent for the last time because, as Butch puts it, quote, did not have a sponge in it. Kind of seems like interest was lost on both the viewer side and the creative side. But hey, that's just me. Butch would then leave Nickelodeon to pursue his own projects until Nickelodeon dragged him back in February of 2021, where they asked Hartman to be a producer on the Fairly Odd Parents' Fairly Otter, a live action animated quasi reboot faux sequel series of the original show that would exist to justify the Paramount Plus streaming service. The show would have Cosmo and Wanda being given to two new kids by Timmy after he heads off to college. After all, it works so well in Toy Story 3 that this concept should be a slam dunk, right? New kids mean new wacky shenanigans, right? Leading up to the premiere, Butch talked up the show and how excited he was to put a new spin on the original for a new generation. And unsurprisingly, Fairly Otter was awful. That concludes The Legend of Roy. Time to hang out these golden fingies. Ah, uh, your mom is still gold. And she'll be fine, but let's recap. Now, I wanted to keep away from subjective opinion for as long as possible. But watching that show try to capture the same magic of Fairly Odd Parents while being live action was just so painful and sad to endure. Nobody liked this show, with fans of the original channeling their burning, seething hatred of it and a dunking on Fairly Otter from all corners of the web. It was universally hated. Then, Fairly Otter was nuked from Paramount Plus entirely and written off as a failure, ending the Fairly Odd Parents chapter of Butch's Fall for now. I'll show them. Someday I'll get at it here. I can hear your voiceover, and no, you won't! So while Fairly Odd Parents died kicking and screaming, as it couldn't actually evolve until 2024, Tough Puppy and Bunsen as a Beast went basically ignored after both shows ended. Butch also spoiled a fair bit of goodwill around Danny Phantom by pissing off fans. And that's not factoring in how on occasion Butch would arrogantly boast about the serialization and Danny Phantom and how it was special, as not many cartoons did that at the time. And that was unique back then. That wasn't really done a lot back then. So I think Danny Phantom really paved the way for a lot more serialized cartoons to come out after it. Yeah, it truly did. Apart from all of these serialized cartoons released or was airing at the same time as Danny Phantom. Additionally, Butch claimed it was a rule in the writer's room that Danny did not fight ghosts, but monsters who took the form of humans instead. And in Danny Phantom, we had a rule when we were writing the show that none of the ghosts would be dead people. We never wanted to be the ghost of a dead person. We wanted the ghost to be creatures from another dimension that couldn't take the shape of a human, or could take the shape of something, but they would never be a deceased person's spirit. Like, you never see Danny Phantom fighting the ghost of Elvis Presley or the ghost of Abraham Lincoln. It is so overly complicated that it makes your brain hurt. Especially when you have ghosts like Ember, Princess Dorothea, Hotep Ra, and Prince Aragon. All ghosts with clear backstories laid out for them. And Ember literally sings a song about how she died. This creative change paints a picture of Butch trying to legitimize his show. But for who? He often brought up religious values which inspired him, but then that seems in conflict. This character just so happened to fight ghosts in the supernatural realm, and I had a lot of people, like Christian people, again, we go back to that religious idea, you know, how can you do that? That's uh, glorifying uh, uh, the darkness. And I went, no, 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 Danny is the light coming into the darkness. Danny is the hero that defeats the darkness. That's what this whole show is about. And, you know, he's the hero that, that you know, makes the world safe against the darkness. And that's what we're supposed to do. But if there are no evil ghosts, it's like Butch jumbled his own show for no logical reason, other than a logic only he can understand. We love you, man. If I pass out, I give you permission to not resuscitate me. From seeing all these leaps in logic and difficulties admitting failure, I think Butch's most obvious Achilles heel is his ego. A lot of his YouTube videos demonstrate this, that his choices and justifications stem from seeking validation and feeding his own ambition. Butch puts himself as the front and center of every project he's involved with, putting the creator of your childhood in his YouTube descriptions without fail. His cringy self-insert character, Dr. Rip Studwell, which appears in Fairly Odd Parents, 
Even the logo of his production company, Billion Fold Inc., is him dressed as a superhero. Insiders of his Fairly Odd Parents crew even share stories where, at rap parties, he would thank God and himself for the success of the show, but not any of the rest of the crew. But with the success of his YouTube channel blowing up, Butch secured a non exclusive three year deal with the multi channel network Pocket Watch in 2017 to develop three animated children's cartoons. What, you haven't heard of them before? Yeah, <laughs> me neither. Pocket Watch is an MCN representing huge children's channels like Ryan's World and Dan Rhodes. Butch's first series with them was Hobby Kids Adventures, based on the family YouTube channel Hobby Family TV. It's your standard episodic show where lessons are learned on various adventures between the three hobby siblings, Hobby Pig, Hobby Frog, and Hobby Bear. Hobby Kid Adventures looks very simplistic in animation and art style, making the show come off like a bargain bin fairly odd parents without the magical wishes. Needless to say, this was quite the downgrade compared to his Nickelodeon days. Oh, we got our first view! Going viral. As odd as this chapter was in his career, it wasn't the source of his downfall, more just a stepping stone of things to come. It was his streaming service that really changed everything for Butch. Who are you? I'm Butch Hartman. I've been in the entertainment industry for over 30 years. Uh, how'd you get in here? <laughs> Doggy door. No, not that one. <laughs> not that streaming service. Butch's first streaming service, or app to be specific. In 2015, Hartman launched his first streaming app called The Noog Network. So, what was it? Well, Hartman launched a, quote, kids safe online network of live shows and cartoons. Whenever a kid goes on the Noog Network, they get a free Noog, and they are guided around the network with this character. They can watch TV, they can play games, they can watch cartoons, and they can earn points every time they watch something and buy more Noogs with their points. It's a lot of fun. End quote. Here's your Noogle. The Noog Network. Download it today. Now, doesn't that sound great? Shows, games, cartoons, ads with Jerry Trainer looking uncomfortable. Hey, Jerry Trainer here You're saying watch the Noog Network. If you don't, they won't let me leave. This network was intended to be the springboard for many of Butch's original pilots that Nickelodeon rejected or were created just for Noog. But truthfully, a lot of the pilots were just low quality, very low quality. A sad quality of the animation and especially the sound mixing is just too shrill to listen to at points. Dr. Philo Fusion, smartest man in the world. Please, Newt, just call me dad. After all, I'm the one that created you. And I appreciate it. And if that's not bad enough, then you get the case of Kuro the Artist. You may know his work on the Five Years Later series, a Danny Phantom fan comic. Butch liked the fan comic so much that he enlisted Kuro to help him produce a short animated pilot for Imagine Nathan. The pilot was about a kid named Nathan who could see other kids' imaginary friends and then went around catching and sending them back to the imagination. Sorry. Those aren't the rules. It sounds like a gumbo made of Danny Phantom, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, with a splash of Out of Jimmy's Head for Good Measure. Kuro made a payment contract with Butch for $1,400 to complete the pilot, under the condition that if the project was canceled, Kuro would receive the full payment. Pretty standard stuff. Unfortunately, Butch put the project on hold indefinitely when the Oaxis controversy happened even though Kuro had submitted his animation work already. Butch denied Kuro payment, telling him that no services were rendered. By abusing a technicality, if Butch puts Imagine Nathan on indefinite hiatus, then technically it isn't officially canceled. Thus, he doesn't have to pay. But whatever his justification was, Butch ghosted Kuro afterwards, cutting communication with no plans to pay him what he was owed. Butch even went an extra step, and completely remade Imagine Nathan with a new animator and posted the new version publicly to his audience, much to the annoyance of Kuro. Seeing no other option, Kuro sued Butch Hartman to get compensated for his work in July of 2020. The hashtag pay Kuro took off on Twitter, painting Butch in a bad light, but not an undeserved one. The lawsuit was a success, 
and Kura was awarded the compensation he was owed. But not without some final words with Butch and his wife, Julianne Hartman. I was contacted by the Nuke Network, not them specifically, obviously, uh, Butch and Julianne, I mean, with a very phony message saying like, oh, Butch and Julianne want, want you to know, like, we really care about your career and we're going to pay you the money that you deserve because we support you. And it's like, yeah, all this is nonsense because if that was true, they would just say it themselves. So I just immediately responded straight up and said, why would Butch and Julianne not publicly apologize? If they really care for me, why aren't they talking to me? There's no way I'm going to publicly endorse them just because they're paying me. So yeah, they, they are, they did pay me. And that is true. There is no public apology to Kuro from the Hartmans that I could find. And a lot of the info around the case has been left unlisted, which is admittedly frustrating. Butch could screw over an indie animator, ghost them, throw out their work, replace him with someone else, and when he's called out for it by everyone, he responds as if he always cared for Kuro's well-being as an artist. Huh. Not very ethical behavior, Butch. Nuke Network may have been a flop of a platform that got into legal trouble, but it completely was overshadowed by the Category 10 disaster that was Oaxis, which many people, including me, consider to be a scam. I love entertainment and I'm so excited to give you the opportunity to help me impact culture. Now, for those who don't know, in June of 2018, Butch started a Kickstarter campaign for another family-friendly streaming service called Oaxis Entertainment. Noog was marketed as strictly kid stuff, with cartoons and flash games. But Oaxis's main selling point was everything Noog had to offer while also protecting you and your children from the likes of seeing sex, murder, and horror movie commercials. Because, uh, <laughs> it's not like Netflix has a specific children's category for family-friendly content already, right? If you go back to the original Kickstarter trailer, Oaxis would not only host Butch's original cartoons, but he was planning on bringing on other creators to make their own cartoons. He also said they would purchase licensing to have high-quality dramas, sitcoms, feature-length movies, animation, kids' shows, sports, fitness, reality, news, video games, and much more. There was even a promise of a user upload feature, similar to YouTube, allowing people to upload their own content to the Oaxis service. All put through their very special Oaxis filter so that it would be deemed family friendly. And Butch promised we could be a part of all this for the startup cost of $250,000. And the backer perks. Talk about being heaven sent phone wallpapers, a YouTube shout-out, $100 original artwork commissions, even an acting role on an Oaxis-produced show if the price is right. Thanks to Butch's built-in fan base, the campaign was a rousing success, gaining nearly 1,300 backers to reach his goal even slightly exceeded it, in fact. It is only with hindsight that we can now say Oaxis seems like a complete snake oil scam. Butch even says, Setting up the company has been the biggest challenge in the last three years. Because you know, Phil, you go to a company, like yeah. Nickelodeon, there's already a Xerox machine there, there's already a water cooler there, uh, you know, there's already an HR department, but you got to set all that up when it comes to your company. He's right. But when you stop and think about just what Butch wanted with Oaxis, it would be insanely expensive to implement to an impossible degree without tens of millions in investment. For contrast, YouTube utilizes an algorithmic intelligence system in order to monitor all the stuff uploaded onto it because it's too expensive and impractical to implement human workers to sift through the mounds of content. YouTube's own system can't do its job 100% correct all the time, and that has been around for almost two decades at this point. So how was Butch going to afford implementing this content moderation system? What about licensing fees? Wouldn't the license fees alone cost more than the initial starting Kickstarter goal? How much of that startup cost will go towards financing that? Even as a concept, the budget Oaxis was setting was too low. Butch Hartman had his fans support, but it would not have been enough to attract outside investors. Next, because it's brand new, it doesn't have the established marketable clout of Netflix, Amazon Prime, or the other multitude of streaming services that have cropped up. One of the ads for Oaxis shows the likes of Kim Possible or Spider-Verse being on Oaxis. Was Butch's plan to walk into Disney Plus's office and say, hello, I'm Butch Hartman, creator of Childhoods, and I have my startup rival streaming 
service that needs content. I'd like your stuff to stream on my stuff, and I won't be able to pay until I get subscribers. Stop wasting my time, you corn-fed man-cow. <laughs> Would you mind? Yes, sir. <laughs> You would need a lot of capital to pull off this sort of business. You would need to either start smaller and grow like how Netflix went from streaming shows and movies to eventually creating original content, or be like Hulu and be owned by a multi-billion dollar company like Disney who can afford to bankroll a project like this. And even Disney isn't making money from its own streaming service. This leads to the biggest accusation of OAxis. Was it fake? Butch talked about all these things he wanted to do with the service, but despite everything he listed above, he was not remotely crystal clear on how he wanted Oaxis to have Christian faith-based content as a key feature. Butch was very sneaky in keeping that under wraps, but soon after the campaign was launched, footage of Butch at a Christian conference was leaked, showing his true intentions for the service. We're going to change culture. We're going to save families. We're going to speak to them in parables. Guys, I am not making TBN. This is not TBN. My stuff has got to be today. It's got to be hip. It's got to be cool. It's got to reach the secular people who are trying to reach. Butch knew exactly what he was doing with OAxis. He's openly stated in multiple written and spoken interviews how religious content is overlooked and how he couldn't put his religious themes he wanted into his cartoons. Like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't put scripture in my Nickelodeon cartoons. I couldn't have Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda say scripture. I, they're not going to put that on the air. However, I could interject, like she said, ideas about Christian themes, you know, family, friendship, love, that, t that type of thing. So while he paraded Oaxis as if his only goal was to make a family-friendly streaming service to protect your kids from the horror movie commercials, Butch opted to leave out necessary information from the backers. Because if Butch was honest... God told me to start this new network that's uh, just completely family-focused, entertainment that everybody can watch, and we're starting now, and it is called Oaxis Entertainment. We're here to impact culture. Yes, that's yeah. what we're here to do. I thought it would be through Nickelodeon, but God told me it's going to be through this. Yes. That's what we're going to do. He knew his audience would be less likely to support the Kickstarter if they knew it was religiously inclined. So rather than risking it failing, Butch got creative with the marketing. He was even caught saying, Working in an, in an industry, they only want to make money. That's all they want to do. And if you can be wise and use your gifts and talents and go amongst them and put your values in there and do it surreptitiously where they're not really noticing, sooner or later, they're going to notice something different about the, way, the place they're working. Fun fact, surreptitiously means to do something stealthful or secretive, to go unnoticed. Once the Kickstarter was getting flack from its backers, it just went dead with people getting the same dismissive stock response about needing to join a, a quarterly newsletter for updates. You even have backers requesting refunds in the comment sections of the campaign. But all fell on deaf ears, with many people resorting to social media to deal with their collective rage and frustration. If ever asked in an interview, Butch would dodge questions or give half-hearted non-answers to the actual nature of Oaxis, claiming that while faith would continue to be a part of his personal life, Oaxis would not be a faith-based service. But after the backlash he received from <laughs> his blatant actions, he issued a written apology. Quote, I am humbled by the kindness and love that heart fans and friends have shown in the recent days. There are simply no words to express my thanks and gratitude. I'm sorry for any confusion that you may have felt in the last week. Thank you for your patience. All I ever wanted to do is entertain people with programming the entire family can enjoy. And, in keeping with that theme, that is what my most recent project is about. There have been others who think they've revealed another agenda. And honestly, I value and respect my fans and friends far too much to ever consider misleading you. I would never take the privilege of your trust lightly. Oaxis Entertainment is not faith-based. However, faith is part of me. I am the same guy I've been for the last 20 years. I'm not perfect and certainly don't claim to be. I'm excited for what's ahead moving forward with this project. Hopefully, it's something you'll really enjoy too. We can discuss all of this, the Twitterverse, YouTube, and more in the coming days. You are the best, and I'm genuinely thankful for each and every one of you. End quote. Wow, that is a non-apology if I ever heard one. 
At best, it's a loose, non-committal apology for everyone else feeling, uh, misled. At worst, it's an exhausting humble brag about how he's only human and isn't perfect, but loves his fans and would never even think about misleading them. Aside from, you know, <laughs> blatantly withholding necessary information from them about the subject matter being put onto the service they gave him money for. You know, like a liar. <laughs> This was the tipping point for Butch's reputation, because even when Fairly Odd Parents was dragging in quality, the nonsense about Danny Phantom, his ego becoming more noticeable, the lawsuit around Nuke Network and Kuro, Butch was able to craft a friendly creative persona that fit his brand of family entertainment that he always strived for, but with his own power. He destroyed a great deal of the good faith his audience had, and the rose-tinted glasses were finally shattered. I want to ask you a favor. I want you to go to this website. I want you to give me your email. We're starting, we've been starting already. We're going around looking for funding right now. The only thing stopping me right now is the funding. And not much. That's not much. Exactly. Not much funding. The only thing stopping me is that. I'm not, by the way, this is not me asking you guys for funding. I'm asking for your prayers. Thanks to OAXIS, the internet united together with more evidence piling up of Butch Hartman's egomaniacal attitude beginning to surface. What once seemed like a one-off mistake now became a concentrated pattern of behavior. People began noticing his YouTube channel's blatant clickbaity titles and thumbnails, repetitive spamming topics for views, and an air of pompous arrogance that made Butch come off as insufferable. It didn't help that Hartman, through his channel, offered to his fans original art commissions for around $200. Okay, fine, that's what he charges, and the prices were clearly listed on his website. But fans who received pieces from him noticed that the quality of some of them were, uh, ew. Life is beautiful. <laughs> it became an entire meme in and of itself to compare Butch's work to the characters he was drawing and see just how much he butchered them. There was such a clear difference in quality from the Danny Phantom and Fairly Odd Parent style everyone grew up with compared to these commissions Butch was making, and it left everyone baffled. You can even find videos from other YouTubers looking at what people received, then redoing their commissions for free, and in a style much more resembling the famed Hartman style. In the best case scenario, that can be explained by the character designs of Danny Phantom and Fairly Odd Parents being assumed to be representative of Hartman's work. However, those designs are Steven Silver's work, not Hartman's. Steven Silver is a prolific character designer, best known for his work on Kim Possible and Clerks the Animated Series, but also did many prop and character designs on Fairly Odd Parents and Danny Phantom. So because of that skewed assumption of who did what, when you see Hartman's true art style, it can be very disappointing. You're hoping for a badass Danny Phantom commission, and what you get looks like Ember was done by a professional artist on the boardwalk, who would do it for a fraction of the cost and with way less of an ego. However, in the worst case scenario, some of these commissions were so bad, it was arguably because Butch may have taken major shortcuts in his commissions. In February 2021, Hartman was accused of plagiarism through his tracing of other people's artwork, like when he published his commissioned artwork of Attack on Titan's Mikasa Ackerman. The artist confirmed Butch did not receive permission to use their artwork as reference or anything. And oh boy, a uh, reference is definitely a stretch with how similar these two pictures are. And let's not forget about his Ranma piece. Tracing isn't unusual for an artist starting out or learning the proportions of a character they've never made before. But this is crossing the line, especially considering they were paid $200 art commissions from a prominent cartoonist using his name as a selling point. Now, this isn't to say all of Hartman's artwork was traced. Many people have had art done by him and been pleasantly surprised. And in the case of his Ember commission, he's done multiple commissions of her where Ember doesn't look so bug-eyed. As an artist, Butch is competent enough, but he can't live up to the same standards he boasts about, relying on his name recognition to put out lesser quality work for a hefty price tag. But his lackluster art commissions aren't even close to the worst thing fans uncovered. Butch's more colorful opinions were starting to seep out. And that same O-Axis convention video, 
He blamed modern-day media from Netflix and similar services for the rise in mental illness and suicide, saying suicide wasn't even thought about back in the day. Constant exposure to corrupt social media and entertainment is a, prior, a primary contributor to this crisis. I know kids who have committed suicide. When I grew up, kids had a hard time, they got through it. Suicide was never even thought about. Where's that coming from? Anything can be changed. So I am uniquely qualified to bring about this change. Mental health struggles have historically been severely underreported and weren't as commonly talked about as they are now. Communication about mental health struggles has gradually become more normalized over the years, with soldiers returning from war changing from being shell-shocked to having PTSD. The language has evolved, but the symptoms have always been there. So this isn't just insulting, it's out of touch and inaccurate. Butch is also on record unabashedly saying that introverted people are selfish. Because it's all about you. You're self-centered. You don't want to get out of yourself and go like, well, maybe I could communicate with these people. You're making everybody else uncomfortable when you're an introvert like that because no one knows what you're thinking, no one knows how you're feeling, and no one knows what to communicate with you. It became a constant stream of uncomfortable revelations as clip after clip surfaced, showing Butch's unconcerned, callous disconnect towards mental health. And no one at the beginning knew where this was coming from. But the most egregious example was in Hartman's podcast, Speech Bubble, where in his interview with Tara Strong, the voice actor behind Timmy Turner, they were discussing Timmy's first voice actor, Mary K. Bergman her friendship with Tara Strong, and how she unfortunately passed by taking her own life. Now, most people would say this was an unfortunate loss, but Butch goes into another direction. No, she had a very prolific career. She was awesome. Doing great, and then she ended up passing away, and uh, I think Tara actually had something to do with that, and so <laughs> that's probably what, that was probably your fault. Uh -huh. No, that was probably your fault. That was probably your fault. Making a joke at the expense of someone's suicide with a jab about Tara being behind it is disturbingly bad form. There's being disconnected from mental health issues, and then there's just not giving a damn about somebody because they're weaker for having a mental health crisis. All these factors paint a picture of a certain kind of person. They're all a key component of why Butch is the way that he is. Here we have a creator who, in his early days of his career, has such a fragile ego that he needs constant reassurance and validation. He was part of a wide variety of projects, but maybe that was not enough for him. He needed something to make himself feel grander, like his aspirations meant something, or that he could change something in an impactful way. Enter Butch's zealous faith in Christianity, a surprising discovery for the average heart fan that leads to an interesting rabbit hole. Now, I've gotten into Christian media and creators in the past who have both good and bad aspects to how they incorporate their faith into their work. So I want to be clear that this section is not an indictment against Christianity. Rather, this is about how one person chose to use his religious beliefs as a justification for some morally dubious behavior, and my thoughts on it. Butch has told this story to a ton of different Christian outlets, but I will summarize it for you. One day in the year 2000, Butch visited a friend at the Crenshaw Christian Center in LA. His friend had just received an award and he was going to leave, but something compelled him to go back inside. When he did, Butch and his wife heard a sermon from Frederick K. C. Price that resonated so deeply with him, his heart was opened by its message. Quote, I ended up getting saved there. Julianne, my wife, got saved there. My mother got saved there at 62 years old. Our kids were raised there. I went from not wanting to go to church to being an usher standing in the building at 5.30 in the morning in a three-piece suit." End quote. This newfound faith invigorated Hartman and his wife, leading to them starting their own charitable foundation with their daughters, the Hartman House Foundation. Their mission was to support people in developing nations and in poverty-stricken communities in the U.S., building homes in Guatemala, feeding families in America, funding aid projects for orphanages in Uganda and Haiti, supplying scholarships and running Pageant 360, an inner beauty pageant to empower young girls. Butch clearly became super passionate for his newfound faith, 
You can see small mentions of it, sprinkled in random places if you pay attention, even verse dropping Luke 10.19 on its old Twitter account and Mark 11.24 on its new one. Now, is there a problem with being openly religious? Of course not. So, what's the problem? Well, maybe Butch can put it best. Now, I don't do Christian shows, but I have Christian values in my shows. Why? Because I'm wise as a serpent and I'm harmless as a dove. Exactly. Wise like the serpent and as harmless as a dove. It's an excerpt from Matthew 10, 16, where Jesus gave guidance on how one should practice teaching his gospel amongst those that would do you harm. In the context of modern sensibilities, being wise like a serpent and harmless as a dove sounds more like being a deceitful snake masquerading as a nice person. It is a description of a con man, and that is ironic considering Butch's history, especially with Oaxis. This is one verse that Butch truly lives by, as it encapsulates how he approaches creating, how he approaches the hustling in Hollywood. He knows his religious ideas won't fly, so he sells cartoons he feels will be viable, but then proclaims that he's been sprinkling in Christian values to maintain his religious base. In an interview, Butch admitted Fairly Odd Parents isn't a Christian show, but that he attempted to inject Christian values of love and family into it. Uh, kinda hard to see the connection here, since in Fairly Odd Parents, a majority of the time Tammy's being neglected or emotionally abused by his parents, which is why he got Fairy Godparents in the first place, and then treating Cosmo, Wanda, and literally anyone else who loves him like trash. Personally, I don't really see any Christian values in Fairly Odd Parents, despite what Butch may proclaim. And remember his thoughts on Danny Phantom's ghost? It's a kid with powers. He has like uh, ghost powers and he fights ghosts. Now he doesn't fight like uh, the ghosts of dead people because I'm a Christian guy, I'm not gonna do that. And uh, I get a lot of uh, people asking me who are Christians, you're a Christian, how can you do a show about a kid with ghost powers? You know why I can do this show? He's the light coming into the darkness and he fights the bad guys, that's what he does. This is Butch trying to have his cake and eat it too, to appease the Nickelodeon executives to green light the show and then to retroactively repackage it so Christians don't think it's satanic with the use of ghosts and the occult. As silly as those examples are, the real issues start when you see the other religious rhetoric Butch's ideals align with. Here's the first lines of an article where Butch was interviewed by Christian Post. Quote, Parents trying to raise their children to be moral, upstanding citizens are being hurtled through a blender of wokeness, gender ideology, and immorality at an alarming rate. For the Christian parent, or any parent of moral decency for that matter, what can be done about it? Quite simply, it is imperative that we expose our children early to the foundational truths in the Bible." End quote. And Butch completely endorses this mentality, the fear-mongering hyperbole to protect you from what's corrupting our youth. It was everywhere in his Oaxis trailer. It seems like today's shows are meant more to shock people than uplift and inspire them. I just recently met an eight-year-old who told me that they'd seen The Exorcist and loved it. The only way the eight-year-old could have loved it is if they'd already seen so much other dark stuff that they'd become immune to that sort of thing. Parents, aren't you tired of being constantly terrified that your child is going to see something that they shouldn't? These are all calculated decisions for that goal in mind. But the moral grandstanding gets even worse when you also account for his wife, Julianne Hartman, and their collective thoughts on mental health. Julianne is behind Healing Journeys Today, an online teaching website and conference. Julianne claims she was able to beat her fibromyalgia diagnosis in 2008 through the power of Christ and her faith healer, Andrew Womack. With Butch's help, her program can alleviate a slew of illnesses, bipolar disorder, lupus, heart and kidney failure, multiple sclerosis, autism, and severe environmental illness. By the way, a severe environmental illness is their way of saying depression. In case it needs to be said, faith healing has no true merit in the world of medical science. But this mentality equates autism and depression as weaknesses and illnesses to overcome through your own will alongside God helping you. And yeah, that's just a fundamentally archaic, toxic, and unempathetic way to look at it. No wonder he has quotes belittling mental health and suicide all over his YouTube channel. He and his wife truly believe that it's something to overcome with faith. And if you can't, then that's your fault. Those kinds of beliefs are dangerous enough. 
but it's the moral superiority that pushes it over the edge. Mostly, I chalk this up to his successes at Nickelodeon making Butch think he's immune from criticism. Whenever, so, whenever you put yourself out there to do anything, there's always someone that's going to like uh, try and bring you down because they've never done anything on their own. So I look at people that critique as weak. Weak rhymes with critique. So, you know, if you're going to critique like, uh, hey, this is, this is never going to work or whatever, then I just say, you know what, let's see you try it and then we'll see how you do. For the record, there is no doubt that Butch and his family have done good things building schools, donating food, and more. But when you look at their documentary for their foundation, Hartman House, the moral grandstanding becomes more blatant. Like when Julianne recounts Hartman House putting up a communications antenna in Uganda. We saw a gentleman come to our church who told us that he needed an antenna in Uganda, in Kampala, to broadcast to everywhere in the villages and in the bush about why people were dying early in life. And basically, it was AIDS. Then there's Butch describing what it was like to help give that same radio antenna. There are no words to adequately explain the impact that it had on me. Now, yes, did this gift have an impact on the community and the people that we gave it to, the radio antenna? Absolutely, it did. But the impact it had on me, the impact it had on my wife, the impact I knew it would have on my children was beyond belief. It just makes one wonder what their priority is. In their Thanksgiving turkey drives, Julianne proudly talks about not wearing gloves, so people accepting food don't feel like Hartman House don't want to touch them. We serve them. We serve them not with gloves on, like we don't want to touch them. We serve them with our bare hands because they matter. This is an odd observation. And also kind of gross, since food handlers should wear gloves because it's more sanitary, but okay. Hartman House feels like a noble goal done with tainted intentions. As despite all the good it has done, the tone of the Hartmans comes across like them doing it for the praise of their charitable actions. The pride-filled decisions to think only they can do this. Only the creator of your childhood and his faith-healing wife could help, which comes off less like genuine aid and more it's for the reward of gaining praise for your actions. Butch and I looked at each other that day and said, oh, that's us. So, Butch obviously is a very religious man who likes to Trojan horse his beliefs into his work. He's also a misleading streaming service salesman who moonlights with his own charity with his wife and family, where they do help people, but have very skewed views on their own charitable actions. Um, so when I'd go throughout schooling and, you know, be super grateful for life when all these other kids around me would be really depressed and sad about really small things, I'd always get to go back to, wow, I guess they haven't gotten to see what I've gotten to see. Is that it? Have we figured out the last bit of the why to Butch Hartman's fall? Does this all explain his heightened sense of ego and superiority? Well, we can't forget his connection to a somewhat cult-like fringe religious group. To be upfront about this connection, what we found is based off a call-out post drafted around the time of the Oaxis controversy which details many connections between Butch, Oaxis, and the Seven Mountain Mandate, an evangelical practice where seven different facets of society need to be controlled and influenced by their version of Christianity in order to create a perfect and godly world, with one of those facets being that of arts and entertainment. Excuse me, are y'all with the cult? We're not a cult. We're an organization that promotes love and Yeah, this is it. So, how is Butch connected to this organization? Well, the Seven Mountain Mandate, or the Seven Mountain Prophecy, is a proposed strategy for evangelizing the modern world and expanding Christ's kingdom. It gained a following in charismatic and Pentecostal churches, where those who follow it believe that the best way for the church to be effective is to bring change in the seven major spheres of influence in society. Education, religion, family, business, government slash military, art slash entertainment, and media. They believe that in order for Christ to return to Earth, the church must take control of all seven major spheres of influence in society for the glory of Christ. Once the world has been made subject to the kingdom of God, Jesus will return and rule the world. So, how does this connect to Butch? Well, remember the video that entirely outed Oaxis as the faith-based streaming service it was always going to be? 
Uh, turns out that was recorded at a Wealth Builders Conference in Lone Tree, Colorado. That sure seems to be endorsing and marketing the benefits of the Seven Mountains Mandate and their impact on getting out of debt with God's plan. So, a religious conference mixed with timeshare boredom energy, and Butch was a guest there to discuss using OAccess to secure one of said pillars. He references that throughout the full conference video that leaked. But uh, I got to hear him speak, and he was talking about the seven mountains of influence. When he got to the mountain of entertainment, my heart just leapt out of my chest. And I turned to my wife and I said, It's us. That is the true context of the video. Not only was OAccess meant to be a faith-based streaming service, but it was entirely a vehicle to, in Butch's own words. We're going to make a dent in this mountain of entertainment, I promise you, and the minute I put this up, people will flock to this. And the conference wasn't a one-off moment. Butch and his wife were brought into the Truth and Liberty livecast, where the title of the episode would be Animator Butch Hartman, Teen Suicide, Depression, and Impacting Culture. Based on Butch and Julianne's last remarks on depression, this won't be pretty. Especially not as the host of the podcast is Andrew Womack, an infamous homophobic preacher. The preacher who got Julianne into faith healing, who also follows the Seven Mountains mandate, owning a company by the name 7M Ventures Inc. and starting the podcast with... We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. Yikes. So Butch and Julianne are in like-minded company, clearly. And the rest of the podcast details their news program with OAccess, talking only positive news, insinuating that suicide rates are up high because of phones. Insinuating OAccess will lower suicide rates by affecting the mountain of art and entertainment. Then flat out just stating OAccess might lower suicide rates. You know, and then, with that, then I believe those suicide rates might go down, and I believe those... those you no, know, just the rate of depression The alone. depression, exactly. You know, and Julianne ended with this nice quote. Mm. Could you imagine living with that, of knowing that maybe someone killed themselves because they watched your show? But all of that is to say the Hartmans were very ingrained within this religious circle. Butch and his family even went on Daystar, an evangelical Christian-based TV network, to sell access to other Christians, and said that God told him to make the streaming service and kickstart it. God told me to start this new network that's uh, just completely family-focused, entertainment that everybody can watch, and we're starting now, and it is called Oaxis Entertainment. God told us to launch this Kickstarter. We're trying to raise $250,000 for our first phase of funding. We have $68,000 left to go. Now, you would think if this was God's idea, that he would have donated a bit more to the cause. Well, don't worry. It seems like Butch and Julianne's religious connections helped the campaign with Oaxis as well based off the majority of backers coming from Colorado Springs, aka right around the Wealth Builders Conference and Andrew Womack's ministries. But that's just speculation. However, objectively, Oaxis was a burning dumpster fire of lies way before it even launched. With that one campaign, Butch's true face was fully exposed. All the pride, ego, his true passion, and what he truly wanted to create. Wouldn't it be awesome? If you could be a part of something like this, to start to start a brand new, wonderful way to influence the culture. We're here to impact culture. That's what we're here to do. I thought it would be through Nickelodeon, but God told me it's going to be through this. Yes. That's what we're going to do. By the end of this odyssey of bolstering and lies, do we really see Butch Hartman as a man that even wants to change his ways, let alone take criticism? An anonymous source contacted me, who worked on Butch's YouTube channel during the peak of Oaxis controversy. Turns out that Butch wanted to control the narrative and tried to get his channel manager to copyright strike every video criticizing him. When he was told that this was a really bad move, and might I add, a flagrant abuse of the system, he left in a huff, demanding something be done. Now I may be screaming into the void, but I think it's good to just reflect on what Butch really did wrong by also looping it back to his own mottos. Number one, have no fear. Butch throughout his career has bolstered a can-do fearless attitude, literally saying on his YouTube channel that he has no fear. Yes, you do. Everyone has fear. Let me put it another way. Fear comes for sure. The fear will show up, but it's your job to push the fear back. You have the power to accept fear or not accept fear. Why would you ever accept it? 
Why would you ever accept fear? Just because everybody around you accepts fear doesn't mean you have to do that. Don't you want to be an original? But we know this isn't true. Like any profound narcissist, Butch does fear what he can't control, uh, specifically the quality of his public reputation and how he's perceived by others, both of which were greatly impacted by his own actions. And I don't think he's mature enough to admit that, that he has weaknesses too, and that's okay. That there are things he does not fully understand, and that's okay too. We all make mistakes, but you're supposed to learn from them and grow as a person. So those fears turn into obstacles you overcame. But because he kept taking actions, feeling that he was the only one who could address the situation, that he always knew what was best, he alienated so many people because of the choices he made. 2. You have to believe in yourself and your work. That also means you have to respect other people's time, work, and effort. From your own crew on Fairly Odd Parents to Kuro, bolstering your own effort while flagrantly disregarding theirs is just tacky. Especially when you also have to put out work that's traced. 3. Don't ever stop and don't ever give up. If you stop, it's completely your fault. Uh, you know, just stop the motto at don't give up. Looking for faults in others is just a toxic mentality that boils down complex circumstances. To say, you seem really depressed and sad. Have you prayed enough? No? Then it's your fault you are like this. It's a rotten attitude that's not only toxic, but undermines the value of re-evaluating your approach if something isn't working or getting outside perspectives from others who've had the same struggles you have. Most people want to help in a sincere way and don't have nefarious or negative intentions. And number four, keep moving forward and be nice to people. Never be a prima donna because the person you're rude to today might be your boss tomorrow. You know, a butch should have taken his own advice. Stop being fake, stop being a prima donna, and just be honest with yourself and what you truly want to do. Actually, in this case, he may have already taken that advice, as after everything, Butch put his all into his next animated project. One that would fully accept his religious roots and fully explore the Christian content that he's always wanted to make for so long. In the garden, imagination flows where rings blow. There's cookie dough. And happiness between your toes. In the garden, we want to grow. The Garden. This one cartoon became a very big property for the Hartman family and became the culmination of everything he has worked on so far. The Garden is not only an app, but it has cartoons, songs, games, and more. This is Butch's current magnum opus, which follows the adventures of Lenny the Lion and Lucy the Lamb, two best friends that live in a magical place called The Garden, where anything can grow. The two serve God, who appears to them as a talking rainbow and they refer to him by the authoritative title of The Boss. Episodes have The Boss, giving Lenny and Lucy daily tasks and challenges. And when the two struggle, they're given a scripture or a song to help them figure out their problems. After that, the day is all rainbows and sunshine. The Garden has pretty much become Hartman's Mickey Mouse, Mario, Sonic, you get the idea. It's their lead project that fully captures exactly what they wanted to create. The one made to spread the gospel, which as we know from Butch, is severely lacking in current entertainment. I'm a Christian guy and I'm my, when I, my kids were growing up, uh, they're in their 20s now, but when they were growing up, I really couldn't find a lot of great quality Christian entertainment out there. So I've always wanted to make a Christian cartoon. Or is there great Christian entertainment out there? Families and they're just really grateful to have something like this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of good entertainment out there for Christian kids, but I just want to add more to the uh, to the marketplace. So He flip-flops minutes apart in the same interview. But with The Garden, Butch and his wife truly believe they can be another great religious piece of content in line with the likes of VeggieTales. We want it to be the next Veggie Tales. We really think it has a shot at at least getting, you know, in that echelon, the same, the same category as Veggie Tales. But Veggie Tales is such a great cartoon. We want to be in that same category. The Hartmans have gone all in on this IP to meet that goal, with Butch honestly believing there was a void that the garden could fill. We really saw a huge hole in the Christian market. And I'm like, you know what? I know for a fact I can make a cartoon to fill that. Uh, to do. Now, this is just our first cartoon. Butch even illustrated his own rendition of the Bible, which is called the Garden Children's Bible, including original drawings of Lenny and Lucy in five full-color comic strips based on the garden and a 1,760-page book. 
Gotta be honest, the cover is pretty goofy looking with Butch's art style of Jesus. Hey, do something! <laughs> this book doesn't have any answers! Now you can enjoy the garden as an animated series on Pure Flix. At least that's what Butch says on his Instagram post promoting it. But during my research, I checked both the US and Canada Pure Flix libraries and I could not find the garden being hosted in either of their streaming libraries. So, eh? When a Pure Flix fails, the mighty Hartman has you covered with GardenCartoon.com, the official site for the garden. Here, you can download the app and get access to games that look like they would have a place on Newgrounds in the early 2000s. However, the cream of the crop are the cartoons that actually look pretty good. The animation isn't too shabby, not anywhere near fairly odd parent standards, but you know, good enough. The songs are fun too, though it ain't no Phineas and Ferb. But you can feel a clear passion behind the garden, unlike any of his others, which makes sense given that Butch has said, I really couldn't find a lot of great quality Christian entertainment out there, so I've always wanted to make a Christian cartoon. And with the garden, Butch managed to fulfill his dream. He has created a show that will help him, <laughs> I guess, fulfill the mandate of his foothold in entertainment and media. But besides the culty stuff, he fulfilled creating a cartoon that was explicitly religious for children, like he clearly always wanted. He's also been expanding the brand to broaden its potential fan base as much as possible, including ASMR scripture lullaby. <laughs> I can't say with a straight face. <laughs> this is a real thing including ASMR scripture lullaby videos, sing-alongs, and demented CGI sensory dances. Can you believe that this wasn't one of those content farm generating YouTube channels? Yeah, crazy, right? Though not nearly as crazy as the Hartman's final goal for the garden. Final question for you guys. How do you, how do you want this to impact people? You've, you've, you've spent so much time on this. What's what's the main goal here with with what you're doing? Is to one day, yeah. well, we're, when we're in heaven, and many years from now, is to have people that are there that as they come into the kingdom, they say, "I'm here because of you." They want to be personally credited for getting you into heaven because they made a cartoon. Do you think God stays in heaven because? He too lives in fear of what he's created. At the end of it all, Butch Hartman honestly ends up better off than he probably should. Why did this happen? How did Butch get to the lowest rung on the ladder for so many people, while also ending up where he can create the religious cartoons he wants? Butch's most upfront quality is also his biggest weakness his unbridled self-confidence. It has warped into arrogance and a severe lack of empathy, which enables him to compartmentalize all the terrible decisions he's made and the countless lies he's told. We've seen this as far back as blatantly lying to get an animation job he clearly wasn't qualified for, to later expecting his followers to foot the bill for a new venture and delivering nothing in return. Honestly, it's not one misstep from him but rather a case of falling off the ladder entirely. But Butch will be fine, as he surrounds himself with diehard fans. Butch places a lot of people around him to help reaffirm his ego, so even when he can lie, fail, and say pretty heinous things, it just bounces off of him. Is that right? Is that wrong? First of all, we're not trying to do anything subliminally or, or to sneak anything into anything. No. This is a straight up. It's pretty blatant. This is a blatant <laughs> cartoon, cartoon. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't want to watch it, you don't have to. Because I'm wise as a serpent and I'm harmless as a dove. Exactly. It just is what it is. And what it is probably isn't going to change. But it's not like he's gotten off scot-free though. His reputation has definitely been marred and any progress he makes is met with great scrutiny. You can still go on Oaxis's website to see how since 2019, the streaming service is coming soon. Now with a new Fairly Odd Parents on the horizon, but with Butch putting his time towards the garden, time can only tell how this new Butch, one that is a mess to his audience, can now just be his own self. Seven mandates in all, but one thing is for sure, he no longer is Butch Hartman, beloved creator of your childhood. He is just Elmer Earl Hartman IV, wise like the serpent and as harmless as a snake oil salesman.